My name is John Bene Ramsey and I'm five and a half. They make a decision, they decide guilt, and they try to prove it. And your job is to prove you're not guilty. And, and that's backwards. Yeah, how do you prove you're not guilty? Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is the Khan's Order episode 15 and this basically addresses the questions you've just heard. How do you prove you're not guilty? And your job is to prove you're not guilty. And, and that's backwards. Yeah, how do you prove you're not guilty? I mean, that's the question, isn't it? And we're going to go through at least three different narratives just to look at how other people were implicated. And then we're going to look at what Judge Khan says on the matter. And we're really going to be starting off on the bottom of page 61, which is about two thirds through the Khan's order. Now, I do intend to wrap up the 20 part series by around about this weekend because I want to start off with a brand new series on Tuesday, kicking off on Tuesday next week. Before we get to today's episode, I want to thank the um, new subscribers. I also want to thank those who participated in yesterday's live and those who have watched the video that I did a lot of work on, um, compiling all of the movie clips into a sort of coherent narrative that basically parallels the Ramsey ransom note. Have you subscribed yet to this channel? If not, have a look down at the bottom right of your screen. There's a light blue icon. Click on the icon, hit notifications, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So we're going to jump right into the Khan's order, bottom of page 61, and this is quoting from the order. A conclusion that the statements were libelous is not inconsistent with a recent holding by the 11th Circuit in another defamation action concerning the Ramsey case, also filed by plaintiff's counsel, Donna Hoffman. In that action, Hoffman Pugh versus Ramsey, plaintiff Linda Hoffman Pugh, and that was the Ramsey's housekeeper, also claimed that the defendants had libeled her in their book by creating a false impression that she was or had been a suspect in the murder of John Bonet. The 11th Circuit, however, affirmed the District Court's decision that the defendant's book, when considered as a whole, does not defame Ms. Hoffman Pugh as a matter of law. The court concluded that the book, when fairly read, did not convey that Ms. Hoffman Pugh was a suspect in the murder. Now, one thing that I find a bit strange is you don't really get the sense that the judge herself has read the book. You don't really get the sense that the judge is really quoting from the book. And so that is what we're going to do. But I want to start off by looking at Linda Arendt's official report. It is a 19-page report. And as early as page 4, she talks about asking the Ramses about who they think could be responsible. Right, and now I'm quoting from Linda Arndt's report. And this is the first reference to, um, you know, who the Ramses think could be responsible, right? It's the first time it comes up. So this is quoting from Linda Arndt's report. She says, quote, I asked Patsy if she could think of anyone who might be responsible for John Bonet's disappearance. Patsy told me that her housekeeper, and her name in the report is redacted, had asked to borrow money on December 24th. Patsy told me that she had had a Christmas party at her home on December 23rd. Then the same reference to the same individual, also redacted, was supposed to clean up from this party on the, the morning of December 24th. Linda Hoffman had phoned Patsy on the morning of December 24th. Linda Hoffman asked Patsy if she could borrow some money. Patsy had said yes. Patsy told me she had loaned money to that party is redacted in the past. Um, the next part also redacted, probably referring to Linda Hoffman Pugh, phone Patsy again on the afternoon of December 24th. Um, also redacted was crying. Redacted said she needed to borrow $2,000. Patsy thought the money was needed for dental repair for, I think it's Linda and her family, but that's also redacted. Patsy told, and it's two words, um, one would assume Linda Hoffman, that she would write a check for $2,000. Patsy said she would leave the check on the kitchen counter. Patsy told me that 
and I think it's the housekeeper, was scheduled to be at the Ramsey home on Friday morning, December 27th at 0900 hours. And then there's a fairly long description about the housekeeper. She told me that the housekeeper had worked for her for about two years, which is a little bit longer than she had worked. I think she'd actually worked something like 16 months or something. She cleans the Ramsey home twice a week. Um, Mrs. Ramsey, or sorry, Mrs. Hoffman is paid $200 a week. Patsy told me that Mrs. Hoffman's husband, his name's Mervyn, um, and there's something about that. Patsy provided me with the husband's name and supplied me with their home phone number. Patsy further told me that the adult children have had problems in the past two months. Patsy believed that one of um, Mrs. Uh, the housekeeper's adult daughters had been in contact with safe house because of domestic violence problems. Patsy did not know the name of this daughter nor where she lived. Patsy thought the daughter lived blah blah blah. Patsy thought the adult daughter's domestic problems might have occurred prior to Thanksgiving of 1996. Now I want to juxtapose those two very detailed paragraphs that basically focus on the housekeeper and her family, right? It's a quite a lot of detail that is given there right, about domestic violence and needing a loan and um, how long she's worked for them and what her schedule is and all those things. And yet, in the Khan's order, the judge says, well, you know, the book doesn't defame Ms. Hoffman Pugh as a matter of law. And if you read the book fairly, it doesn't convey Ms. Hoffman Pugh as a suspect in the murder. Now, what I think the court is missing here, and it's just my opinion, is you know one of the ways that you claim libel is malicious, um, maliciously accusing someone. So in other words, you know that they are innocent, but you accuse them anyway, right? Now, um, I think you could possibly make the case that um, because the Ramses implicate a whole lot of people in their book, um, it's not malicious because they're basically saying, well, it could be this person, could be that person, could be that person, could be that person, and none of it's malicious. I think the other side of the story is the grand jury um, found that there was sufficient reason to vote to indict the parents, not the housekeeper and not anybody else. In fact, the housekeeper testified to the grand jury, right? And I think if you think about it from another perspective, first of all, the grand jury side, and also um, what was the first thing that the Ramses said, and the Ramses eventually became suspects, but what was the first thing that the Ramses said to the police? Well, the first thing was that they implicated the housekeeper. Now, what is interesting in Linda Oren's narrative is that she asked Patsy right in the beginning, right, it's the b bottom of page four, which is, really, you know, um, less than a quarter of the way into the the entire report, she asked Patsy who Patsy suspects, and Patsy says the housekeeper. It's only much later in the day, and I think this is after 10 o'clock, after the time for the call had come and passed, at the bottom of page 7, so almost halfway through the report, that she eventually asks John the same question. She says, um, this is a quote from... Linda Orange report. She says, I asked John if he could think of any past or current employee of Access Graphics who might be responsible for the disappearance of John Bonet. John told me he was not directly responsible for hiring or firing, but then he did mention a specific individual, and we'll deal with that in another narrative, but still in this episode. And then he gives quite a lot of um, detail there as well that. Um, the employee was forced to let go about five months earlier. He gave the name of the employee. Um, he spoke about his wife, said where they were living, and he had, hadn't seen him since then. And um, he said besides that person, he couldn't think of anyone else who uh, he'd had a disagreement with. Now, before we go further, I think it's quite clear that whoever wrote the ransom note was actually trying to create the impression that it was an inside job and it was something the Ramses themselves said, which is, you know, how would someone know John's bonus? Also, um, why would they uh, speak to him in such a familiar manner? 
and you know things like that. Something that is very interesting with the ransom note is it starts formally Mr. Ramsey and it ends off informally calling him John. And I think that discrepancy is also worth taking note of. Um, you would think that if it was, say, the housekeeper, that she would maintain that formal tone throughout, calling him Mr. Ramsey, Mr. Ramsey, Mr. Ramsey. Um, someone who starts off with Mr. Ramsey is probably disguising what she really thinks about, you know, in terms of the whole thing. In the movies that I've cited in a previous video, I think Mr. Stone is used constantly in Ruthless People and Mr. I must say I'm not sure about this 100% but I, I wonder whether Mr. Mullen in the case of Ransom is also used throughout. Okay so now we're going to go to the narrative from Detective Steve Thomas and what I want to emphasize here is the chronology of the suspects as they are identified, right? So, and as they are identified by the Ramses. So, in Linda Oren's report, it is first Patsy who um, implicates or identifies or points the finger to the housekeeper. And then only much later does John suggest, well, it could be the uh, co-worker from Access Graphics. If we go to Steve Thomas's book, John Bonet, Inside the Ramsey Murder Investigation, we go to page 26. So it's very early in the narrative. He talks about the following, and this is quoting from there. When detectives asked the parents who might be responsible for the disappearance of John Bonet, Patsy promptly gave the name of her housekeeper for the past two years, Linda Hoffman Pugh, who had recently asked for a $2,000 loan. Now, I think what is important to note there is first of all, the detective saying promptly that Patsy didn't hesitate. She immediately implicated the housekeeper. And also, if you think about where the ransom note was left, it was basically the path that the housekeeper would have taken, right? Um, you can also imagine if they did find out that the ransom notepad and the, and the pen came from within the house, well, who would know that they would be there? So you can see how that thinking sort of fits in with that. The other thing is, I think it's clear that the detective probably leans somewhat onto Linda Oren's report. He probably read the report because he talks about um, her being the housekeeper for the past two years. The two years isn't strictly speaking accurate, but it is apparently what Patsy said that the housekeeper's length of time had been, right? And then it goes on to say, this is again page 26, just one more sentence, quote, The handwriting in the ransom note, the mother said, also looked a little like the housekeeper's, end quote. It's quite interesting that he says, the mother said, he doesn't say Patsy. And I'm not sure that I see that in Linda Arndt's report, but I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if Patsy said, you know what, the, the handwriting in the ransom note looks like it could be Linda's, right? And of course, Linda Hoffman Pugh said the opposite. She said um, in the first chapter, the opening chapter of her book, she said she recognized certain idiosyncrasies in, in Patsy's handwriting in the ransom note, including um, using abbreviations like SBTC and words like attache with a little accent on the E and so on. Now we're going to go to the other detective's book. and I just want to reinforce what I've just said there is that when Steve Thomas talks about um, you know who was identified as a suspect the first person mentioned in his book is the housekeeper right now we go to detective Kola's book foreign faction and I'm just going to quote a very brief section on page 33 and it's dealing with the same thing right quote she related possible suspicion of Linda Hoffman Pugh due to a recent request for a $2,000 loan. And then it says, Aunt was subsequently told by Father Roll that Patsy Ramsey also wanted her to know that Hoffman Pugh had previously mentioned concerns about the kidnapping of John Bonet. So, end quote. And the impression you get from that, although it's a little bit indirect, is that um, the, the pastor then approached the officer 
and said that Patsy wanted the officer to know that Hoffman Pugh previously mentioned that she was concerned that John Bonet might be kidnapped, something like that. I don't know whether what that is angling at is that it could be a member of her family. Um, I don't know whether that is what is being implied there. But so you see two added dimensions, one in Steve Thomas's book and one in Kolar's book. The dimension in Thomas's book is that the handwriting is described as being similar to the housekeeper's. And in Kolar's book, it is described as, well, the, the housekeeper herself was saying, you know, I'm worried that John Bonet might be kidnapped. And it sort of comes through indirectly. At the end of this chapter on page 33, uh, Kolar quite astutely notes that the, the ransom note starts off by addressing John Ramsey formally, but by the end, the kidnapper is speaking as though they're intimately familiar with John and the family. One wonders whether that was done intentionally in part of the ransom note or whether it was uh, something that happened by accident. Personally, I think that the last page of the ransom note, which is really a, a half page, has got a lot of someone's personality in it. I think the first two pages have got quite a lot of borrowing from movies, but I think the very last page has got a lot of the personality of the ransom note writer. And I think you've also got to wonder what is the ransom note writer trying to get at when they're talking about, well, we know there are a lot of other fat cats around here and also um, something about use that good southern common sense. How would they know about something like southern common sense if they were either a foreign faction or if they were, um, you know, how, how else would they know about the southern sense, southern common sense notion, other than if they were, to some extent, insiders, right? Now, the final narrative I want to refer to is the Ramsey's narrative, and it comes up very early in their book, The Death of Innocence. In fact, this whole thing about implicating someone comes up early in all three of these books. So you are you have the seed planted very early of well if it's not the Ramses who else could it be and and the immediate suspect is then the housekeeper right so on page 19 of the death of innocence about two lines down um, it's written quote the police want to know if I know of anyone who would do this Linda Arndt asks if there's anyone who might be upset with me personally or work-wise anyone who has threatened me he says, I think for a while and then tell them about Jeff Merrick, right? So in this version, you have John telling Linda Arndt as early as page 19 that he suspects it's a ex-employee, a disgruntled employee, right? So the order here is kind of switched around. And then a little bit lower down on the same page, page 19, Again, this is quoting from The Death of Innocence. It's now the part dealing with Patsy. This is quoting from The Death of Innocence. Quote, the police ask Patsy these same questions about who might have been angry or acting strangely. And she begins to think about our cleaning lady. Linda Hoffman Pugh had called Patsy a couple of days before Christmas, very distraught and in tears. Linda said her sister was also her landlord, was going to evict her, dot, dot, dot. Now, what's very interesting in The Death of Innocence is you don't have Patsy talking on her own behalf about Linda Hoffman Pugh. You have John um, saying, speaking on Patsy's behalf in their narrative, right? He's talking about what um, Patsy, he says, she begins to think about our cleaning lady, now think about how that contrasts from what Linda Arendt wrote and also what Steve Thomas wrote about promptly identified the cleaning lady or the housekeeper, right? Can you see how the one presents it as gradual and not, not particularly focused on anyone in particular and the other scenario is quite clear on it's very likely to be this person, focus on this person, right? Um, it goes on to say she asked Patsy if she could borrow 
$2,500. So this looks like it's more money than was mentioned to Linda Arndt. And then Patsy had consoled Linda and agreed to lend her the money. Patsy intended to leave the check for Linda on the kitchen counter. And that's the end of the quoted section from page 19 of The Death of Innocence. I just want to touch lightly on page 20 where it refers to um, something about Patsy late. This is quoting from The Death of Innocence. Quote, Patsy later tells me she was thinking and the, the next part is italicized. If it's Linda, it's okay because she's a good, sweet person. She's just upset. She may need the money, but she won't hurt John Bonet. And that's the end of the quoted section. So you have quite a clever way of um, illustrated this, illustrating this, in my opinion, where you don't have Patsy addressing the reader directly. You kind of have the thing where Patsy tells John, and then her her words are sort of almost thoughts that she's she's thinking something she's not expressing it but of course it's communicated in their book and it's sort of softened if it's linda so in other words if linda's um done something with john Bonet, it's fine and what is being implied is that patsy doesn't know that john Bonet has died of course she has um john doesn't know that john Bonet has died of course she has and it's okay if the housekeeper's done something because probably John Bonet is still okay, but she's not okay. And the reader knows that. So there's quite an interesting thing going on here, whether you want to call it a ruse or something else. This is quite an interesting situation. And um, and then there's also the little part about she may need the money. In other words, within that little fiction or whatever you want to call it, uh, scenario, um, is this idea, well, you know, she needs the money, it's fine, kind of thing. I think if you want even greater clarity on the extent to which the Ramses um, pointed the finger towards the housekeeper, one would have to look at the interrogation statements, but we're not going to do that in this episode. There's just not time. So again, I've got to say, I wonder whether the judge read the book, read any of the books in this case. Anyway, going on, this is quoting from the Khan's order. Key to the 11th Circuit's analysis is the defendant's failure to ever state that Ms. Hoffman Pugh, defendant's housekeeper, was considered to be a murder suspect by them or by the police. Let me, um, <clears throat> let me read that again. Key to the 11th Circuit's analysis is the defendant's failure to ever state that Ms. Hoffman Pugh was considered to be a murder suspect by them or by the police. That's interesting, don't you think? After what we've just read. Instead, the book states that before they knew their daughter's fate, at a time when they believed her to have been kidnapped and were running through their, their minds people who knew John Bonet, the defendants never believed that Miss Hoffman Pugh would hurt their daughter even if she had kidnapped her because she was a good, sweet person. Now, you can either say that that is very clever, very shrewd narrative license, or you could say, well, the... The, the judge is quite clever in in realizing this or the lawyer who presented this evidence was quite clever in doing the same thing. I think you could also make the case that wouldn't the Ramses have been advised on how to say certain things in their book that would um, leave them in a legally defensible position? How do you say something that is um, not kind and not perhaps even true you make a, an aspersion, but it's nevertheless legally defensible. It goes on to say, in addition, the 11th Circuit notes that Ms. Hoffman Pugh does not fit defendant's profile of the culprit detailed later in the book, which describes a male aged 25 to 35 who is either a former convict or has been around hardened criminals and who had access to a stun gun. Uh, funnily enough, in that um, profile there's nothing about the individual being a foreigner or someone who watched a lot of movies no that's just not in there or someone who's educated enough to use words like attache and gentleman and so on anyway it goes on from the Khan's order quote finally the court concludes that when read in its entirety the book indicates that miss hoffman pew is not a suspect 
Alternatively, the panel concluded that even if defamatory, the statements were non-actionable statements of opinion. In the instant case, however, plaintiff does fit the profile of the murderer set out in the book, meaning Chris Wolf, and was discussed in detail as a viable suspect in the murder investigation. Indeed, in recognition of these substantial differences between the Hoffman Pew case and the case pending before this court, the Eleventh Circuit noted that the statements regarding the plaintiff were not the situation before us. In short, the sting or gist of the passages in the book suggests that the plaintiff is a viable suspect in the murder. Such an accusation is defamatory. Of course, that a given statement is defamatory does not mean that the defamation is actionable. As noted, truth is a defense to a libel action as is the expression of an honestly held opinion. Certainly, many of the statements about Plaintiff Wolf recounted above are true. That is, Ms. Dilson did recount the described information about what she believed to be Plaintiff's suspicious behavior. I must say, with regard to that, one's got to wonder what was the situation between, in terms of their, their relationship. You know, you might talk about the motive of Chris Wolf, but what about the motive of Ms. Dilson? That doesn't seem to be part of the narrative here. Likewise, plaintiff was questioned by the police concerning John Bonet's murder. Indeed, defendants arguably understated the police department's interest in the plaintiff. I find that part very interesting. And in the Dateline documentary from 2016, Detective Jane Harmer talks about they didn't they didn't investigate anyone as much as they investigated Chris Wolf, and it sounds as though they investigated him even more than they did the Ramses. That may sound hard to believe, but if you bear in mind that the Ramses um, didn't really give that much access to investigators, you can imagine others were investigated more thoroughly than they were. And it looks like Chris Wolf was one of them. This also kind of pours water onto the contention of don't focus on us, focus on someone else. Well, they did. Um, contrary to what the complaint indicates, Boulder authorities have yet to clear plaintiff of possible involvement in the murder. So what's quite interesting is even at this point, they still think that Chris Wolf could be involved. And on that basis, it's very difficult to say how on earth can you not taking that into con uh, if taking that into consideration and as well as what we know about the grand jury vote, how, how on earth can you not um, think that this is a violation of his rights? Further, he is the only suspect to date to have been arrested in connection with the murder investigation. Once again, that's, that's very aggravating, the fact that he, he was actually arrested. Now we go to page 64. It goes on. Ultimately, the inference one draws from the passage is the defendant's belief not that plaintiff actually killed their daughter, but that there's a reason to suspect that he might have. Defendants argue that this is a non-actionable opinion. Plaintiff has argued, however, that this is not an honestly held opinion because Mrs. Ramsey actually killed her daughter and her husband knows this. And it's unfortunate that this is the wording from the plaintiff. It's unfortunate that this is the opinion as well because it's not it isn't correct and you can understand that the judge would have um, seen things in specifically in terms of this area the way that she did it goes on to say accordingly plaintiffs argue the Ramses could not believe that plaintiff or anyone else is a viable suspect because the Ramses know they are the perpetrators of the crime that's from the Khan's order this court likewise concludes that, as to this narrow theory of defamation articulated by plaintiff, the statements at issue are defamatory. So that's quite interesting. Um, according to the narrow theory of defamation, they, the, the court, Judge Khan, says that the, the statements are defamatory. Now comes the second test. And it's a crucial test. And the next test is, were the statements made with malice, right? And we're going to be dealing with that question in the next episode the Khan, of the Khan's Order number 17. So I'll see you guys for that. 
um, probably tomorrow or perhaps the next day so look out for that again if you haven't subscribed to the channel please do like share leave a comment and i'll see you guys next time